Okay. So we've been talking about evangelism, right? Rather rather timely discussion, isn't it? Given Amber's trip and her activities, given the opportunities that are presenting themselves to us as a body, whether it be at the Slopstacle event coming up in a couple weeks or at the Memorial Day Parade. But I want you to ask yourself for just a moment, what's the point of evangelism? Right? Have you ever stopped to think about that? What's the actual point? What is it we're supposed to be doing? What's the purpose of the good newsing that the common people of Acts chapter 8 did? Right? Because if you go out and you do your internet search, how do I do evangelism? You'll find a master class or some other thing, and it'll say, hey, this is how you do evangelism. The common way it is taught is to work on a person, to get them to the point where they're ready to accept Jesus. There are churches around the United States this morning that will delay the end of their service, extending their altar call, just to be sure that everybody has a chance to come forward to say the sinner's prayer. To have them repeat the words from the pulpit. You know these. Say it with me. A variant such as, Lord Jesus, for too long I've kept you out of my life. By faith I gratefully receive your gift of salvation. I'm ready to trust you as my Lord and Savior. We see variations of this all over the world today. The focus seems to be to get that person to come to the point where they realize that they need something else. They finally say, What do I need to do, or what do I need to do in order to have eternal life? <clears throat> and once they say that prayer, your task changes to give them the message of great relief that comes in with salvation, teaching them that their, need, that their need has now been forever met, that they have no need to be consumed with the worries of life anymore, assuring them that their place in heaven is now forever secure. We all know this kind of class, don't we? This kind of class that there was a 30-something-year-old Jew in the region of Judea who would have failed that class. There was no way that Jesus of Nazareth could pass that test on evangelism. He would have never gotten the certificate. Instead, we see in Scripture, a story of a person who came up to him and asked that very question, what do I need to do to have eternal life? And that person left sad and rejected by the standard of most churches today. Even ones that believe the Bible, Jesus of Nazareth, the evangelist, failed completely. He never closed the deal. So, with that in mind, I ask you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. <clears throat> Starting in verse 16. And behold, someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said to him, why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good, but if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall, serve, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept. What 
am I still lacking? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, with people, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Quite a statement, isn't it? <clears throat> we have the advantage of being able to read this story from three different perspectives. From Matthew's perspective that we just read. And Mark writes about this in Mark chapter 10. And Luke even writes about this in Luke chapter 18. Each of them recount this one story in their own way, each emphasizing the parts of the story most important to the context of their account of Jesus' life. And so although we're going to concentrate this morning on Matthew's account, the fact that three of the four Gospels include the same story is significant. <clears throat> I've said before that when there is repetition in an oral tradition, especially in a, even in a written tradition of this time, when there is repetition, we need to pay attention to it. So let's pay attention to this story today. It starts out well enough, right? In verse 18, the young man knew he needed something and he didn't have it. Behold, someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? He didn't have it. He knew he didn't have it. And so not only did he not understand that he didn't have something that he needed, he also knew the right place to get it from. He got it from Jesus. He went to Jesus who had come into this area that verse 1 of Matthew, or I'm sorry, yeah, verse 1 of Matthew indicates that it's in the area that's beyond the Jordan, in the region of Judea. Mark recounts for us that Jesus was setting out on a journey when this man came to him. It, it's, it gives us the idea that Jesus has been there. He's been ministering in the area. He's been explaining things to people. Uh, have you ever known Jesus to go through an area silently? No, not once he began his ministry. He was telling people about the kingdom of heaven. He was telling people about eternal life. He'd been in the area and he, he was about to leave. And this young man comes to Jesus. He knows the one to whom he needs to go. Mark, Mark 17, or I'm sorry, Mark Chapter 10, verse 17 says this, And he was setting out on a journey, and a man ran up to him and knelt before him and began asking him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Do you get the significance of it? There, there, was, there was an urgentness to what this young man was doing. Jesus' teaching has had an effect on this young man. He's pondered it. He's worked it over in his head. He's been around it, and Jesus is about to leave, and he realizes that he does need something that he doesn't have already, so the only person that he can get that from is this guy that's about to leave. So running up to him before he leaves is the only sensical thing to do. He's gone and sought Jesus out. This wasn't a halfway measure. He was full of zeal. He didn't delay. He understood the urgency of his need, so he wastes no time. He wants to be sure to get his answers from Jesus before Jesus leaves. 
not only did he come up to Jesus in the right velocity, in the right way, in the right focus, he also humbled himself before the one who he knew could solve his problem. Pretty amazing when you think about it, right? Not only that, but he asked the right question. I mean, we nowadays days we look at this and we hear people railing against him. Well, he, he wanted something to do. He didn't want to just understand the faith. But given his teaching, given the, the, the things that he had been around, he knew that he needed something that he didn't have. He didn't know what it was. This was the most reasonable per question for this young ruler to ask at this point. What good thing may, shall I do that I may have eternal life? Just think about this. He's a ruler in the area. The fact that he's a ruler, remember, Jewish culture does not differentiate between the civil authority and the religious authority. He's probably a ruler in the synagogue that he attends in that region. And he just exclaimed to everyone around who would hear that he didn't have eternal life and that he was going to someone else to find that out. He knew he didn't have it already. He was willing to go to the one who did. It takes a lot of courage to admit your fault, doesn't it? It takes courage for me to admit my faults. I don't like doing it. I want to show a bravado to everybody that, that I know everything. I've got the answers. One of the things that I've had to learn to say is, I, I don't know. This is an evangelist's dream. Do you know how many concerts, how many cantatas, how many plays... How many community events, how many campaigns, ad campaigns, area-wide church ministries are geared just to get people to this point? This man just runs up to Jesus and blurts out the question. What a dream, right? The fact that he's a ruler also tells us that he's prominent in his community. He had to have been a well-known and well-respected young man. He, he's the ideal person that you want in your church today. He's young, he's vibrant, he has the clout. He came to the right person in the right way with the right question, and he even understood something's missing. He skipped over most of the work of evangelism today. Just go back and think about that. When we started, we talked about the, the focus of evangelism to being to get to the people to the point where they'll turn to Jesus. Right? The, to, the, be the, to bring them to the point where they're ready to accept Jesus. Make certain that someone has the opportunity to come forward and Confess Jesus. Say Jesus is Lord. Right? This guy's there. He is right where we want a person to be. He's very desirable in the church of today. He doesn't need to have the existence of God explained. He doesn't need to have the authority of Scripture explained. He doesn't need to have his need for something else explained. He already knows that. He already agrees with that. So he just, as it were, jumps to the head of the line and says, how do you get eternal life? I mean, you've got to be really bad at evangelism to blow it at this point, right? Right? 
Think about this from the disciples' eyes. Right? This young, influential, sincere man who's excited, who's keen to join the club. The first addition, the, the, I'm sorry, the perfect addition to their merry little band. From the story so far, most churches today would be putting this man up soon as a deacon. Get this guy signed up. Make him a committee chairman. Make certain he gets the good seats where the sound is just perfect. He was desirable. He was ready to sign up. He is so unlike the Pharisees that Jesus has been dealing with that. He has enough integrity to realize that he's missing something. He really does want to know God, and he really does want to be right with God. And importantly, he's willing to do something about it. He just can't put his finger on what. Imagine, then, the disciples' confusion at what happens next. Verse 17, And he, meaning Jesus, said to him, why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In effect, Jesus is saying, you're a well-taught Jew. You're a ruler in your synagogue. You already know what is good. You already know how to get eternal life. You have the law of God. Just do it. Don't let it be lost on us that this young man is seeking eternal life because he feels anxiety and frustration. He feels that there is a need. He's trying to fill a void. He literally ran up to Jesus in order to find the happiness and joy and peace that he's looking for. And Jesus rebuffs his aspirations of relief. He points him straight back to the law that he already knew. It's not even the whole law. You get that, right? It's the second table of the law. The, one, the part that relates to other people. These are the ones that you can look at yourself and think, boy, I'm really getting somewhere. This was the less impossible part of the law to complete. There's a contrast here today between Jesus and the evangelists of today. The evangelists of today are people whose message is that in order to heal your tiredness, your problems, your anxieties and frustrations, all that is needed is to turn to Jesus and to say a prayer. People who proclaim that happiness and joy and peace is yours only if you run to Jesus. That God has a wonderful plan for your life here and now. Just just raise your hand. Accept that. This young man has done just that. He literally ran to Jesus. And he was met with what? The law? This man knows his life. He knows how he's lived. He thought he was really okay. Look at his answer. In verse 20, the young man said to him, all these things I have kept. What am I still lacking? He could tell that there was something missing. He's certain there's still something undone. He just needs to know what it is. Now, if we've been paying attention, we'll realize that Jesus has been slowly setting the proverbial snare around this young man's proverbial neck. 
inching him closer and closer to the truth ever since this young man came up and tried to superficially flatter him, addressing him as good in Mark and in Luke, seeing Jesus only as a mere human who could give him that special insight and add that little bit that would make his life be right before God. Rather than recognizing him as the Son of God in the fullest sense of the word, being good. He did not come to Jesus as God. He came to Jesus as some guru. And rather than simply giving this young ruler the answer that he would have realized had he been reminded of the law, Jesus instead begins leading him down the path necessary for this young man to discover it for himself. Verse 21, Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Jesus knew this young man was lacking that he had some parts of the idea in his grasp, but not all of them. And he didn't have them all brought together in in a whole and complete idea. The discussion that they had had to this point merely confirmed it to everybody else there. Understand that. This is written for our account. Jesus didn't need to discover any of this. He already knew it. This man, this young ruler came up and asked about what do I do to get eternal life, had an incomplete understanding of eternal life. He had an insufficient understanding of how to get there. So Jesus, Mark tells us, loved this man. Tried to bring him to the point that he understands. You see, this young man thought he understood. He thought that he wanted eternal life. He thought that he had found the surefire way to get it. That this roaming teacher would just hand over that last piece of the puzzle that he needed. No, though. Jesus put his finger on the part that was his missing piece. But in his own obliviousness to his own sin, the young ruler simply couldn't get it the first time. Jesus had already exposed to, for him that the question of sin. Let's go back, go back up real quick. If you wish to enter into life, in verse 17, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, which ones? Did this young man understand the words of Moses to keep the whole law? The words of Joshua? Keep the whole law? No. He wanted to just pick one of these. He wanted that easy out, as it were. The issue for this young man was not the money he had. In verse 22, I'm sorry, let's go back, verse 21. Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, Go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have the treasure in heaven and come, follow me. You get that? Do you understand that the money's not the issue at hand? Remember, Jesus likes to speak in parables to those who are outside the body and then explain fully to those inside the body. 
he's speaking to who? He's speaking outside the body now, right? He's using the, mon the man's money and wealth as a way to help the man understand his need. Verse 22 says, when the man, young man heard this statement, he went away grieving. For he was one who owned much property. You see, this young man thought he understood. And Jesus exposed to him his sin in one question and he couldn't figure it out. He wasn't going away because he didn't get eternal life. Why, was, why does it say that he went away? Because he had great wealth. He had a lot of money, right? He went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. He wasn't leaving on account of the fact that he couldn't get the eternal life that he thought he deserved. <clears throat> the issue was not the money. The issue was the place of prominence that the money had in his life. He had to be brought face to face with his great love of his great wealth that had supplanted his love of God in his life. For had he kept the law in the way God requires, murder, adultery, theft, Mark here adds to this list defrauding his neighbor, bearing false witness, honoring your parents, truly loving his neighbors. That stood at odds with how he had acquired and kept his great wealth. And Jesus brought him face to face with the reality that even though he knew he had an emptiness in his life, even though he was aware of a great need, he had no understanding at all that he had violated the law of God. Let's go back. This is important. Verse 18. Oh, let's start at verse 17. Then he said to him, why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, all these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? Has he actually kept these things? No. He has no comprehension that he has violated the law of God because he's looking only externally and looking at, the, even in that, only on the surface. Understand that at this time, the Jews had developed all sorts of rules and ideas about what it means to be wealthy in your ability to be right with God. They equated wealth with closeness to God, of blessing by God. He couldn't be saved because he could not comprehend his need for salvation in the first place. He had become convinced of his worthiness, certain of his worth to God, so that even when Jesus offered him the opportunity to see his own error through the law, all he could see instead was what it cost him. He had no comprehension that he had offended the one true God, the God who is so holy that he is unable to look favor, favorably upon sinners. In a way, you could put this to an imaginary conversation today, right? You know, think about it. Say now, Jesus, how is it that I get into the kingdom of God? Well, keep the commandments. Which ones? The ones Moses gave you. Oh. Well, which ones do I need to actually do? Those ones. Those ones? 
Yeah, those ones. Uh, how, how about how about just this one? Uh, no, no, all of them. Oh. I, I suppose I could do the minimum on this last half. No, no. Actually, you have to do all of them and you have to mean it in your heart. In my heart? Yes, in your heart. But you have to mean it. I suppose I can do that. Yeah, yes, I, I think I can. I'll say that with a lot of emphasis. No, 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 that's not what I mean. What do you mean then? I mean that you have to mean it so much that it's more important to you than anything, everything else in your life. In fact, it needs to mean so much to you that you need to give up everything else to get it. Jesus, you can't you can't be serious. You don't you don't mean everything, do you? All my money? The respect of everybody in the round, in the area? Yes, yes, I mean even that. Oh no. I I I, I can't do that. I guess I don't want eternal life so much after all. Imagine. The stunned disciples, so excited at the prospect of this young man, watching his face become haggard before their eyes as he begins to comprehend Jesus' demand that which he valued most in order to obtain eternal life. This man who moments ago they were certain would join them would become prominent in the kingdom of God. The eternal life that Jesus had so often spoken of to them. Remember in rabbinic Judaism, the richer you were, the more blessed by God you were. Because the richer you were, the more alms you could give. And the more alms you could give, the more deliverance from the law you could purchase. That's how it worked at this time in their minds. Jesus shocked everyone, even his disciples, at what he says next. He says to the young man, looking at the young man, he says to his disciples that are beside, verse 23, Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it is harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm sorry. It is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That challenged everyone's understanding of salvation, everyone's understanding of true righteousness in God. Now, part of the statement, there's a lot of misconception on. People have invented a needle gate. That you had to take the bags off a camel in order to get... No, no, that's not, that's not it at all. There's a Persian saying that predates this, that says this, to to declare something completely and utterly impossible, they describe it as passing an elephant through the eye of a needle. Needle, they're talking like a sewing needle. Right? In fact, in Luke's account, he uses the technical, you know, Luke is very technical, he's very precise, he's a physician, he uses the, the... technical name for the needle that's used by a physician to sew into human flesh. All right? He's just adapted that, fra- that, that Persian phrase to the Judean frame of reference. But he's talking about the true impossibility of it all. This is talking about a real, tam- a real camel. You know, big thing, tall as a horse, right? Has humps on it, maybe one, maybe two, really tall, runs through the desert. No, it really is impossible 
for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And praise God that he does not stop there. Verse 25, And when the disciples heard this, they were astonished and said, Who then can be saved? Why are they saying that? What's their frame of reference? The richer you are, the closer to God you are. The rich people can get into the kingdom of God easier than the poor people because they can give more alms. That's what they've been taught all their lives. That's how we think in this world today. There is no difference. And what Jesus is saying is that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. Who then can be saved? In looking at them, Jesus said to them, with people this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Jesus' answer revealed to them the reason for this whole encounter. That salvation on our own, on our own terms, by our own power, by simply adding a little bit of Jesus to our life is not sufficient to save us. It will only leave us frustrated. It will only leave us grieving and dejected that there's no hope for us in that. On the other hand, rejecting everything of our own doing, placing all of our hope and trust in God to the point Get this, to the point where we are willing to give up absolutely everything else. Our wealth, our prestige, our power, our freedom, all of it and more by recognizing that we have offended God. Do you understand that from this? Jesus took this man back to the law, to the second table of the law, the one that might be easier for us to try to say, oh, I might have done a little bit of improvement here or there. But he wants us to understand that we cannot please God by ourselves. We must repent of sin. We must abandon our own personal sin of trying to do it our way rather than trusting fully in Jesus as Lord and Christ the way He requires. In that, in that repentance, the repentance that this young man, this young ruler who came to Jesus, he came in the right way He came to the right person. He asked the right question. He never came to the right understanding that I have sinned before God and I must repent of my sin. In our evangelism today will be completely ineffective and will be worthless if people do not recognize their own sin on account of our good newsing. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ starts not with trust Jesus, but starts with my sin before God. If I am not willing to confront and recognize I have offended God, I cannot be saved. I can sure look good. I can have the right clothes. I can have the right attitude externally. I can drive the right car. I can have the right house. I can have all the right things. I can be in the right position in church. But if I never confront my sin and recognize it as sin, I will never be saved. Because inherent in salvation is an understanding of what I am being saved from. As we consider how to reach our community today, 
Yes, we need to engage them. Yes, we need to invite them and talk to them and tell them about Jesus, but we also must. It is demanded of us that we show them their sin. To do likewise, I'm sorry, to do otherwise is blasphemy. To call Jesus Lord and to never realize my own need of Him for salvation is blasphemy. Because I am saying something with my mouth, something I never believed in my heart. How should we reach out to our community? We need to tell them about Jesus Christ, but we also need to tell them about their sin. To not do so does them a disservice, and worse, will give them a false sense of security. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. Father, I praise you that you have chosen to save me, a sinner. One who has offended you. Who stood in opposition to you. Who has actively rebelled against you. That you loved me so much that you worked in my heart. You gave me faith. You gave me the belief necessary to turn to Christ. Father, I pray that as we consider how to share the gospel with others, that we would not give them that false sense of security and that false sense of worth but we would show them and live our lives for them, declaring that there is a need for salvation because we need to be saved. That it is not an empty word of empty meaning, but that it is a rich word, full of life. Help us to rightly admit our guilt before you. Help us to do what this young ruler was unable to do, to to face the truth of our sin before you and to turn from it and repent from it and abandon it all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This has been a free presentation by Hickory Corners Bible Church. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting us through hickorycornersbible.org slash give. Hickory Corners Bible Church reserves all copyright protection under applicable law and in accordance with our Christian Copyright Licensing International streaming license. For more information about us or to connect with us, please reach out through our Hickory Corners Bible Church Sermons YouTube channel, our Hickory Corners Bible Church Facebook page, or our hickorycornersbible.org website. Our pastors are also available to talk weekdays from 9 to 4 Eastern at 269-671-4505. We hope you will join us next time as we continue helping ordinary people passionately follow Christ.